Ben, welcome to the Glenbeck program. How are you, sir? I'm great. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. You bet. Um, I I hear from my people uh, that y- your people are concerned that this is a gotcha interview. Or the, I don't ever do that. Uh, I don't invite people on my show, uh, it, it, at least without telling them from me in advance. It's going to be a tough interview. So relax. I am fascinated by what you're doing, but I also am very concerned about it and i want to hear what you what you guys are thinking cool well, no i mean I, my i guess pr teams and your people and my people you know they always have their opinions on things i mean we're a pretty open book right and yeah. we're pretty excited about what we're doing and you know we love to talk about it with you know not everyone loves what we're doing right uh, we've been, we've been very fortunate to have you know a lot of support but you know i feel like it's our job to have conversations with all of the groups and really educate the people what we're doing and be transparent about it, right? And and then let people form their own opinions. It's not really our job to persuade anyone one way or the other. So I'm just I'm just happy to be here. Okay, um, so let's talk about what you're doing. First, I want to state your company's mission and goal: through technological and engineering breakthroughs in biosciences and genetics, Colossal is accepting humanity's duty to restore Earth to a healthier state while also solving for future economies and biological necessities of the human condition. Colossal will revolutionize history and will be the first company to use CRISPR technology successfully in the de-extinction of previously lost species. On the journey, we will build radical new software tools and technologies to advance the science of uh, genomics, is that how you say it? Genomics overall. Uh, genomics. Yeah. Uh, genomics. Okay. We are the leading, we are leading the new charge of bioscience. We accept the responsibility. We see the light at the end of it all. What you're currently working on is amazing. You are trying to bring the woolly mammoth back into, uh, away from extinction and back into. Uh, uh, life. Why? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so fundamentally we're working on three species, the woolly mammoth, the Tasmanian tiger and the dodo. Um, and we believe that the extinction and bring species back, leveraging all these genetic rescue technologies, not only can help bring these incredible animals back and help restore those ecosystems, but can actually develop technologies that we can use to advance conservation uh, because conservation needs more money. It needs more tools, it needs more technologies uh, because we could lose up to 50% of all biodiversity between now and 2050 if we're not careful, uh, as well as advance the same tools and technologies that can be applied to human healthcare and help from everything from cancer research to genetic engineering and getting rid of certain types of disease states uh, in humans. And so it's kind of a systems model thinking to kind of the, one of these big challenges that we think a lot of technologies will come from it that can benefit uh, both conservation and uh, uh, humanity. Who's who's your chief ethic, uh, ethicist? So Alta Charo uh, uh, is one of our ethicists. She's our lead ethicist. And we picked Alta because you can learn a lot from a critic. And so we actually went after uh, uh, to talk to we after early early on our journey, we went after Alta and a few other people because uh, Alta specifically had debated George Church years before on why you should not bring back a woolly mammoth. Right, okay. And so we really want we really want people like that, like informed critics that can help us do things in the most transparent way, and also make sure that we're educating the general public in conversations like this on what we're doing and taking that feedback. Okay. Is, I mean, I, I don't mean to be flippant with you, but have you ever seen Jurassic Park? Uh, I actually have seen Jurassic Park. I've seen all of them. They're, I'm a big sci-fi guy. You know, I've started most, all the companies I've ever started are technology companies, so I'm definitely inspired by Jurassic Park, which was a movie, just to remind all the viewers. Right, but is there anything that you won't bring back into life? I mean, you're bringing three species that have been extinct. Uh, Is there anything else you won't bring back in? I think you need to be really thoughtful about the why behind what you're doing, right? And so the species that we're working on, served a, a, a purpose and filled an ecological niche in their 
local ecosystem, right? And we're driven to extinction either directly or indirectly uh, by mankind. And so that's where we're really wait. The woolly mammoths on. were killed by man. Yeah, early man actually hunted uh, mammoths. And what's interesting about elephants that most people don't realize is that they take 13 years to get to sexual maturity before mm. they can breed. And there's a 22 month gestation. So you don't have to kill all the woolly mammoths or all an elephant population to, to push that species into extinction. You just have to uh, create enough that you get that downgrading effect uh, through the population. And then you get genetic bottleneck, which ultimately led to their extinction was genetic bottleneck in, in the species. Uh, Meaning there wasn't enough diversity in the species to continue on. Um, and so same thing with, you know, with the dodo, we actually eradicated uh, the dodo. Most people think that we, that we just ate the dodo, but we actually, most of the dodos died because mankind actually brought in invasive species to Mauritius in the surrounding islands, uh, which actually, you know, killed a lot of the uh, young as well as uh, the eggs since they were laid on the ground, since they were flightless. And then lastly, the Australian government paid people through a bounty program to eradicate the Tasmanian tigers. And why would they do that? Well, it, now, uh, you know, looking back on it, um, it was really driven by uh, the sheep uh, industry. So all of the folks that were ranching were actually, they've proven now, were actually stealing and poisoning and killing each other's sheep for competitive means. They blamed it on the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylacine. Uh, but there's no, uh, you know, data to suggest that the thylacine could even, one, attack a sheep or two, eat a sheep. It ate smaller you know, marsupials in kind of their, their um, in, in their stack. Okay. So let me go back to the question. Is there anything that you won't bring back? Yeah. I mean, there's lots of stuff that we won't bring back. We're focused on these three species, right? And so I think that there's, we get asked a lot of time about dinosaurs. We also get, believe it or not, you can't, unfortunately, for the people that love dinosaurs, you can't bring back dinosaurs. There's no DNA. It serves zero purpose to bring them back. Uh, weirdly and re really weirdly enough, though, we get asked about the megalodon a lot, which terrifies me that people would even ask that question. Glenn. My son would um, ask that uh, question. Yeah. People yeah. ask that question. And I'm like, do you really assuming that we could, which we can't, why would you ever I mean, the ocean's already scary enough. Why would you ever want something like that out there? And so so we have kind of a uh, our ethical framework of, of what we focus on our species that can help restore existing ecosystems uh, where mankind had a uh, complete uh, role in or partial role in their extinction. So, so you we, we oh, have. OK, go, go ahead. No, finish. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say we have some frameworks around it. So there's a lot of things that you can't bring back and there's even more that we won't bring back. All right. So there um, the the woolly mammoth, you say, hunted by early man. But the reason why you have the DNA is because they were flash frozen, if I'm not mistaken, strangely, uh, way up uh, north in, in Russia. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, they were frozen in the permafrost. And so what happens in the permafrost, unlike what happens in, you know, the rainforest and whatnot, in the rainforest, you get this nitrogen oxygen cycle where things die to get quickly eaten or absorbed into the into the forest floor. Uh, and then it's kind of a rinse and repeat. In the permafrost, it's exactly the opposite. Things die, they fall over, maybe they get partially eaten, but then they get covered with the next layer of snow or ice. So it's really well preserved. And so, I mean, we've, um, I have not been to Siberia, but Ariana Husili and George Church, George being my co-founder, have actually been to Siberia. And actually, when they've extracted uh, uh, mammoth carcasses, they still have like blood and tissue in them. So we actually have a lot of tissue. It does degrade over time, DNA, um, but we actually have 54 mammoth genomes that we've acquired that we've used to build our reference genome. That's kind of our guidebook for our engineering efforts. Okay, so is it true that, they, that some of them were flash frozen with like butter cups in their stomach? Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, I don't know what was in their full microbiome and in their stomach uh, when they died, but some of them froze nearly instantly uh, and are incredibly well preserved. What what it, what would cause that? Oh, uh, there's so many theories, you know, on that. Right? Uh, obviously, you know, it's cold. It's already you know sub freezing temperatures up to negative forty 
you know, in the winters. And so if things stop moving, you know, mammoths and a lot of other species uh, that, that can survive, you know, in not just the Arctic Circle, but Circle Polar North, which is a little bit wider than the Arctic Circle, actually have different ways to produce things like hemoglobin and blood genetically than we do. So they actually have the ability uh, you know, to survive and thrive in those environments. And we wouldn't even be able to breathe in some of those environments, and- yet they could. But when that, when that system stops and everything stops moving and that heat generation stops, uh, everything freezes. All right. So when you look at... Uh bringing them back uh have you thought about the impact the unknowns you know uh, who was it rumsfeld said there's knowns and and the 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 unknowns that are unknown uh have you thought about reintroducing a, a pretty large species back into the uh, the ecosphere and and the ramifications of that that are not necessarily good? Yeah, I mean, you always have intended and unintended consequences with whatever you do. If you look at probably one of the most successful rewilding campaigns, rewilding the process of reintroducing a species back into its native habitat that no longer exists there, one of the most successful rewilding campaigns of all time, with a relatively large animal being, you know, the gray wolf, was back in Yellowstone where we as humanity reintroduced wolves back in Yellowstone uh, after 70, after we called them 70 years before. And that has led to a complete blossoming of that ecosystem. It's actually added more diversity. Right, right, right. But, but wait, 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 wait. Let's, not glo- wait. let's not gloss over because I remember when they were taken and my grandfather said, what the hell are these people doing? You can't collapse an ecosystem like that. Everything works together. It was the scientists that first said, we've got to get rid of the wolves and it's going to be fine. Uh, And it didn't work out that way. And the people that I grew up with that are just, you know, farmers and hunters and everything else were like, you cannot remove the wolves. So your grandfather was right. And not look. Just because you're a scientist and you have a Ph.D. does not mean you're right. Right. Yes. We are. We aren't right about everything. Uh, Our teams. I'm not a scientist. I'm just. I, I just have the fortunate, you know, ability to work with really smart people doing really interesting things. But fundamentally, science, just because you're a scientist doesn't mean you're right. Lots of scientists have done lots of weird things. Um, your grandfather and the people that you grew up with were 100 percent right. We need to respect nature and this, you need to assume the system works for a reason. And when we interfere with it, to your question, you know, there are consequences. And so with what we do know right now about the tundra and the Arctic is that it's a completely degraded ecosystem. But what we know from all of the research of that land is it used to be kind of like Yellowstone. It was full of different large cold tolerant megafauna like mammoths and mastodons and muskox and whatnot. So if we can return those animals, we hope that will help, you know, uh, replenish that ecosystem and build a better uh, diverse ecosystem. And they've done little experiments like this over time including uh, in uh, a place called Pleistocene Park, where they've reintroduced cold-tolerant megafauna, not mammoths yet, right? Uh, and they've actually seen the benefit of the Arctic grasslands start to come back. So I have to tell you, I'm really torn on your research. It's easy to say, really bad idea, um, but you make a good case. Uh, and so I, I am torn on it, but I, I'm, I'm a guy who thinks what Bill Gates is doing with mosquitoes is a bad idea. Wait, we're going it's to just a lot easier. Yeah, but we, it's a lot easier. Oh, sorry, God. That's food for a lot of animals. A lot of animals. Bats come to mind. Yeah, and it's a lot easier to roll back uh, an unintended consequence from a multi-thousand pound animal than a mosquito, right? Like when you start to look at the world of genetically modified organisms or, or GMOs, you know, I think that, you know, we don't have as many, I think, challenges. We have different challenges, but it's a different set of challenges than people that are working with like mosquitoes or gene drives where they really have to be mindful of the unintended consequences. We definitely need to be mindful of the unintended consequences, but, you know, we're not going to lose a right. several thousand pound animal. Okay, hang on for 60 seconds. So many things are happening in the world that I can't believe I... I talk about in a serious sort of way, everything is was science fiction and it's becoming science fact. Um, 
so let me just ask this question. What stage of resurrecting the woolly mammoth are you at? I think we're closer than some people think. You know, uh, you have, as I mentioned, you have to go through a whole list of different components like computational biology, cellular engineering, uh, animal husbandry, and surrogacy. So we built those whole teams. So we have about 112 people and scientists, uh, mostly based in Texas, that are working on this. And we're on track to have our first calves by 2028. Um, that could slip, but we're pretty confident right now about the timeline. We've already assembled the amount of DNA that we need to be successful. We've already leveraged AI and software tools to to map mm-hmm. that to the eight to the Asian elephant reference genome that we had to also create. Remember, we, it's not just about the mammoth. We had to go create a reference genome for the Asian elephant. We've done all of that comparative analysis using AI computers, and then we've established these cell lines, and then we've started to make edits. Uh, um, and, and actually the CRISPR edits and the other genetic engineering tool edits into those cell lines. And so at, once we complete our full list of editing, we'll go through the process of, you know, cloning, which is also known as somatic cell nuclear transfer, and, you know, put it into an elephant surrogate to, to grow. Well, Ben, thank you so much uh, for being on the program. I, I think I'm right where I was before. Uh doesn't sound like a good idea, um, but you have better reasons for doing it than I thought. Uh, and I, uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Ben Lamb yeah. from uh, Colossal.com. Last comment, real quick. No. Okay. Uh, ben Lamb from Colossal.com. Back in a minute.